All right, all right, all right, gang. We're back for another one. As always, you're joined by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. As usual, we want to give a massive thank you to all of our sponsors. Seeds here now, number one seed bank in the industry, all the hottest breeders, all the latest drops, and a guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. There's no reason to shop anywhere else, gang, I promise you. If you're not happy at the end of your grow, hit them up. They'll sort you out. They've also got some cool Heavy Days genetics. Check it out. Likewise, a massive shout out to our friends at Pulse Sensors. You know them, you love them. They've got the best unit in the game to help you track all of the parameters to ensure that your next grow is the best to date. Whether you're tracking temperature, humidity, VPD, PPFD, or so much more, the Pulse unit will ensure that your next grow produces more resin, more terpenes, more flavor, more yield. God, what more could you want, guys? Whether you've got a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation. It's time to get serious, guys. Get a pulse. Massive shout out to Organics Alive, helping all of the organic fanatics out there to grow the most incredible crops to date with their amazing powdered organic products. They've got products specific for each stage of the growth cycle, whether you're in veg, transition, bloom, or need a specific calcium or bud booster. They've got everything you need. Check them out, guys. Organics Alive, truly one of the highest quality organic companies on the market. Massive shout out, Organics Alive. Likewise, a big, big thank you to our friends at Dynavac. If you are looking to improve your respiratory health, I recommend you give vaping a go. Dynavap is the vape that helped me to get off bongs and I cannot recommend them enough. If you want American made and engineered vaporizer technology that's not battery dependent, grab yourself a Dynavap M series. I promise it hits like a sledgehammer. You will be left asking yourself, what is this? Truly an incredible vape brand on an awesome mission, American made and designed. Check them out guys, Dynavap, we really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for your incredible vaporizers. Last but not least, a massive shout out to our good friends at Copit. You know them, you love them, the world leaders in pest and predator technology. If you've got spider mites, you need to check out the Spidex Vital Plus. Guess what guys, COVID have changed the game yet again. They've now got breeding sachets, which help you to avoid having to spread carrier material on your crop. You hang the sachets in your garden, and over time they release high amounts of the predatory spider mite, Phytocilius persimilis, into your crop, and ensuring that you keep spider mites at bay. If you're battling a heavy spider mite infection, you've got to check out the Spidex Vital Plus. The reason why Copet have become the international powerhouse they are is because their products are so amazing. I promise you, if you're battling spider mites, check it out, guys. Huge shout out to Copet. We appreciate you guys helping to keep our garden pest and pathogen free. Huge shout out, Copet. And finally, a quick plug for the Patreon. If you love the show and want to ensure episodes keep happening, please go check out our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. You will get access to a wide range of unheard Patreon exclusive episodes. You'll also get early access to upcoming episodes. We're like three or four episodes ahead on the Patreon. We've also been giving away genetics every fortnight on the Smoke With Heavy Discord sessions where we chat about genetics, do presentations on molecular biology, give away a whole range of cool swag and just catch up in general with like-minded budding enthusiasts. As always, a massive shout out to the Patreon gang. You guys are the lifeblood of the show. We appreciate you so, so much. On the episode today, we got a special one. I was asked to join Skunk VA and Staten Island for an old time catch up. Lots of banter between these two guys. Some cool old school stories, a bit of history, and some plans for the future. So without further delay, let's get into it. Alrighty, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to a special episode today. We are thrilled to have a reuniting of two old friends sharing some old stories, some memories, a massive welcome to the Chem Kings, the incredible Skunk VA and the infamous Staten Island, aka Gabby Garden Spout. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. 
Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me. What a whirlwind it has been over the past few weeks seeing you come to the surface of the scene. I would love to hear. What have you been up to recently? Oh, go ahead, Gabby. Um, well, I've recently been hired as the cultivation director at Green Brothers Farm in Lockford, California. It's not fully complete being built. Um, right now, we're putting in the racks and the lighting and have to get the final approval you know, from the city that everything is proper. So we're hoping that we're operational July 1st or July 15th. And so I'm extremely excited about this project because it's a, it's quite a large one. And it's, it's been being put together by a group of people that I've known since the beginning of the Garden Spout. And they're hiring people that they know and trust. And so that's how I was brought onto the team. And, you know, so far, everyone else is being brought on the team is people that I know and people that I love. So it's exciting because normally like a big project like this is going to be super corporate and, you know, th this one isn't, although I'm, you know, I know it's got financial backing. It's still a family <laughs> business. Yeah. So I'm excited about that. Right on. Incredible. How about you, Jason? Of course, Jason is making the, the chem dog seeds of the future with his company lucky dog thanks gabby thanks so yeah i mean that's what i'm doing same thing i was in december uh, except for the new news is and i don't know if i mentioned it is we're back open here as of january 6th the whole state shutdown license transfer thing is over i'm really happy now we're just trying to get people back to the door and now we got some bigger things. We're making a, a solventless lab right now. We're getting inspected on the 25th. Uh, we're going to just be doing all solventless products there. And, and then me and, me, and, me and my buddy Gabby have some good news too. We're, uh, we decided to uh, team up and, and start working on providing some genetics, focusing on clones. And we're going to do some seed collaborations together with uh, some breeding projects, Kim Dog Heavy, of course. Um, and so, you know, I'm super fucking excited about that. I'm super excited to be working with Gabby. We've had literally 30 solid years of knowing each other as of February this year. We met in February of 1993, all those years ago. And so it just, I mean, we talk a lot more now and it just feels good. And um, I'm fucking excited. I know my friend Gabby's excited and, you know, we're ready to just get it going on and kind of you know, put the put the old school and the chem and the chem kind of stuff, the gas back in what's available out there for folks. You know, they're definitely hungry for it. So, yeah, that's it. Wow, this collab that sounds really awesome. When did this first uh, come into life? You know, when did the wheels start turning on that one? Thirty years ago. Thir yeah, thirty years ago. That's exactly what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> We planned this all up 30 years ago. We just waited a while, you know, we just wanted to make it right. So I think we got it now. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, I sometimes, mean, sometimes there's a pause in the middle, you know, but yeah. Jason was actually the first person that I ever partnered with in cultivation. Really? Yes. I mean, I was growing prior to that, but I was doing it on my own. And Jason was the first person that I ever helped grow and that I, you know, we were partners initially at the beginning. So I, I think, and, and Jason's memory is much better than mine, but I think the arrangement that I used to make with people when I would set them up is that like we would share the first harvest or the first two harvests and then they were on their own. Is that what I did with you, Jason? Do you remember? No. No, you had a, a much a much sweeter deal for me. You had a so whatever we grow in the in the bedroom, I sell to you and you alone. That was the deal. <laughs> Minus my head Sounds like a good deal for both of us. Yeah, it was a pretty good deal. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and I was already at the time I was already buying every bit of your crop. Like I actually had a little piece of paper in my wallet with phone numbers on one side. And, you know, these pieces of paper fall apart. You have to redo it. And then on the back, it was uh, um, your harvest dates that you kind of would whisper out to me, you know, so I could make sure to get in touch with you. So when those uh, buckets of super skunk were ready, I could go ahead and get them because you always had uh, 
it was always Tupperwares. It was never bags. It was never bags anywhere. It was always right. perfectly cured weed and Tupperwares, brand new Tupperwares. And the Tupperware, of course, came with the weed. You put about a quarter pound of whatever it was um, in a Tupperware, and I was always making sure that there was no reason to sell to anyone else because I would show up <laughs> <laughs> and smoke it with all my friends, you know. I was listening to the podcast number two where Jason was telling the stories about how we met. And I hope that, you know, not to be too redundant, but I hope Jason will tell the story again, because if not for everybody else, I just love to hear it, you know, for my own <laughs> selfish reasons, you know, I mean, like he'll tell the story way better than I can. Okay. Please you'd be do surprised it. how often I, you'd be surprised how often I get to tell people that story. And I actually fucking love telling people that story because you know, my memory, the way, the way my memory kind of works is like, I get visuals. Like I remember like, you know, moments and like very detailed moments. Almost sometimes I can even smell, you know, like the smells, you know, like the Panhandle park, it smells like eucalyptus, you know what I mean? It smells like San Francisco and that's got a very unique smell to it. And like that jogs my memory. And I love that, you know, but yeah. So back in those days between, you know, Grateful Dead tours was for three times a year. And I was, uh, at this time, a permanent, you know, on tour i was a, you know what do we call it a, a lifer i was on tour you know i did there was no place for me to go after tour so it was the van in san francisco <laughs> and when you're in you know you're when you're in, in grateful dead land money's just in the air you just gotta you know you know kind of do what you gotta do reach up and grab your bit it's a it's a marketplace you know a lot of people kind of don't know that and the, the, the ones of us that were there kind of overlook it maybe we don't like to talk about it because maybe what we were selling was probably you know not legal still and so <clears throat> but when you left tour you know making your money was a little difficult so we would end up in san francisco um mostly because the next shows were probably going to be jerry at the warfield and also that's just kind of where everybody landed i mean also because the grateful dead literally told you to go there <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of reasons. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you go to the panhandle and if you're, if you, you know, while you're there, you might as well sell a little herb to strangers to get your head stashed. And that's kind of what my day was like every day for those periods of time. And I'm sitting, the thing about it was, is there was a spot where everybody would hang out. And that was where, the, you know, there was a rail there for skating and, you know, it's like a big blacktop. In the panhandle, well, if you hung out there, <clears throat> the problem was is the cops would come sweep the park every now and again, and they would roll up on dirt bikes. And, you know, if you were holding, you know, you might have a problem. And we're talking like an instant felony. This is, you know, 1990s. So we, I would always stick away from it because it wasn't really fun for me. It was kind of like stressful. You know, I don't think it was fun for anyone. It was stressful selling weed to strangers. And uh, so I'm sitting on a bench in the panhandle, and the panhandle is like a long, straight, thin piece of the park of, of Golden Gate. And that's why they call it the Panhandle. And I'm sitting on this sidewalk. So you can see people walking from very far away. And here comes this guy with this big old grin on his face. You know, he's got a hip sack on, he's got a ponytail and he definitely looks like he wants some weed. And I'm like, wow, man, I slow down, buddy. Like, don't be so loud about that. The cops are everywhere, you know, but um, so when he got to me, I was ready to serve him. And before I could say anything, he introduces himself in a thick New York accent and he asked me, he says, uh, you know, I, I asked him, do you want to buy some herb? And he goes, actually, I'd like to, I was going to ask you the same thing. And so I was like, well, what are you talking about? And so he's like, I, you know, he told me basically what was going on. He was very open. He's like, you know, I've moved to California. I came out here to see the Jerry Garcia band as much as I can at the Warfield, which I totally understood. It was no need to explain that any further. <laughs> and he said that, you know, he didn't know anybody, which I didn't know anybody either, really. So I understood that part and he was having a rough time, you know, getting his ends met uh, financially because he couldn't sell the weed. Let's go look at the weed. So we walked all the way over to uh, the central district where he had his van park. And I guess I'll just tell all the details. He had the van. He had this long navy blue van. Uh, that's kind of hard to explain, but the only way I can explain it to your audience is, you know, if you see a van, like an old, like, uh, you know, Dodge van or Chevy van, and you'll see the extended van. You can see the line on the back where it actually got extended. Well, this van actually had another line with another two feet behind it. I don't know how long the thing was. Gabby, you might be able to remember, but it was like, it had to have been like 16 feet long, 18 feet long. It was incredibly long. And we pile up in that thing and we kind of leveled out his scale and he pulled all this amazing indoor weed out. The Francine, 
And I don't remember the fluffy sativa one, but that was the one that really crushed it that day. Um, I think those were the only two. And it was very little Francine. <clears throat> and Gabby had mentioned earlier in episode two on your podcast that I had mentioned that he was showing me the chem dog. And he was right in pointing out that that would have been no way he showed me chem dog. So it was Francine and some fluffy sativa. So he hey, said, listen, Jason, I can, can I interrupt yeah. you? Can I interrupt of course. you? You need to leave me every opportunity possible to put you in your place. Okay? So just, don't just don't just admit that you're wrong before I get to tell you that you're wrong. Okay? <laughs> All, right. All right. You got you got it. I can do that for you. I can do that okay. for you. All right. Yeah. Just don't rob yeah. me at the moment. Oh, I won't. You're gonna have you most of the moments. This. You're gonna you're no. gonna have most of the moments. And there's just like a couple here and there that you know, I just I need to be able to, you know, have that for myself too. I, yeah, I you're the you. big star you over here, and I'm. The, you're the big star, and I'm just like the up and comer and everything. You know. What do you mean? So you're just you're the home. legendary. <laughs> you're the legendary Staten Island. It's just you just didn't know it until the other day. <laughs> I didn't know it. I, I mean, honestly, mm -hmm. at first, I'm just like, I was so offended that people were calling me Staten Island. I'm like, what <laughs> the fuck? Like, you can't think of anything nicer to call me. You yeah. know, like. I mean, you said such nice things about me on the podcast, how I, like, grew the best indoor weed you'd ever seen. And, and this, but sure. then somehow I'm just known as Staten Island, like the fucking place that smells bad. <laughs> I did not name you Staten Island, but I have called you that because the public led me to call you that. But I did not name you that. I promise you. However, you do know that once you're when you're inside New York and you're a New York native like you are, Staten Island's one thing. But to the rest of the universe, Staten Island is just New York. <laughs> now, so I know. Call me, call Island me New York. Call me New York. New York then I Gabby. sound like a fucking baller. Yeah, then I sound like a baller. <laughs> Staten Island, I just, I just sound like there's something wrong. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was like the garbage barge that was stuck. They had nowhere to like put the garbage because they wouldn't, oh, take, I remember they wouldn't that. take it anymore on Staten Island. But it's just like, it's literally just never ending garbage. I remember that. And it yeah. smelled bad. It, sm it smelled bad. Well, it's a dump. It must unless smell bad. You, unless, unless you were right outside a brother's pizza, it smelled bad. <laughs> so go ahead. Continue with the story. It. Oh, yeah, the story. Um, oh, so, you know, so backstory. What was going on in the city in, you know, the February of 1993 was, you know, so, you know, you're going to find some outdoor weed, October, November, December, January, especially. But around time January comes, February, it starts to dry up, especially back then. And <clears throat> those years, for some reason, it was just so hard to get, like, good weed. And you have to get weight. So weight is what that means is you get weight means you're going to get 28 grams for that ounce, right? Weight is what you get. And then you go break up some hates, like eights, but hate streets. So hates. Hates is where you get 10 if you're nice, 11 or 12 if you're kind of stingy, eights out of an ounce. So four eights for you, eight for the crowd. You know, that's how you make a little bit of money on a $425 ounce. And that's from your buddy. This isn't like tax. This is just what it is, you know. And so that's what's going on in the city at the time. It's, you know, it makes things very difficult. Like the money, you don't make enough money to, you know, barely get by or survive. So... There he is, Gabby. We're in his van. He shows me. He opens up his duffel bag, and I'm like, "Holy shit, that's fucking beautiful indoor weed. We haven't seen any of that around here in a while." You know, mostly it was like outdoor weed. <laughs> so he said, "I was like, all right. Well, here's the question: How much do you want for that?" And I can't remember exactly, but the number 285 pops in my head, or 325 pops in my head. Either one of those numbers would have made me holy shit, is what I would have said, because that would have definitely helped. And I said, listen, if you just stay here and give me a minute, I cannot walk around with this duffel bag in this neighborhood. That won't last very long. But if you stay here and just bear with me, <laughs> I got a lot of walking to do, but I can get rid of all that. And so that's what we did. He just hung out there. I, I just want to interject Hello. something that you said on the previous podcast. I want to make sure you don't skip it here. You said in that podcast that it was the greatest indoor you've ever seen. I think, I think, I think we should focus on that. Just like for, you know, not for too long, but for the, the greatest indoor you've ever seen. And he had seen hey, some at that point. I have, yeah. So, you know, 
20 year old JK, that's me, 20 year old JK, uh, walked, you know, his whole deal in the country was to find the best weed. That was what it was all about. I mean, it was the music, it was the good times, but really, you know, the weed is right there. It's at the top. So <laughs> in order to do that, you know, back then you kind of had to like, you know, network with growers and, you know, I was happy to meet a new one. And it, I mean, I can't disagree about it being the, the most high quality indoor I've ever seen. I mean, the guy puts his, Gabby grows incredible weed. He always has. I mean, this is the man who taught me everything I need to know the, on day one cuts and all. And so, you know, I was so like elated. I couldn't believe it. It was like my lucky day. So it was, it, you know, it helped me out so much. But um, that day, I was a rough day. It was a rough period. Like, you know, I had just gotten off the green tortoise coming from Eugene, Oregon, left my girlfriend, my dogs up there to come to the city to make money. I mean, it, was, it wasn't always easy. It was really hard, actually, a lot of times being on the road. And this was a hard period. Um, the cops were rough on us. I remember a few of my friends were missing when I got there who were in jail for selling weed. And, you know, so it was rough. But So this was like a, a shiny spot. This is like one of those moments that when you're traveling around, you know, it's like, fuck, man, what am I doing, man? Like, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I can't make it another day. I'm like, I'm in a park, practically homeless, you know, and or I'm on the road and I'm, you know, I can barely afford gas to get to the next show. And they're like, I think it's time for me to maybe go get a job or something and go back home right then. You know, something like this would happen, like meeting Gabby in the park or I can name a million things where it's just like it just gets you one more day. And that's all you need is just one more day. Just to remember, like, hey, I belong here. This is okay. I can make this, you know. <clears throat> so this was one of those moments for me. Was, you know, I was contemplating wrapping it up and maybe going home and trying to find a little easier way. And uh, so anyways, I sold all that weed. And when I was done, you know, Gabby expressed to me that he was very grateful and, you know, that he was actually thinking about the same thing. He was thinking about maybe he'd made a mistake by coming to California and that he was hoping that, and I think the quote was his, his, uh, I don't know if it was you that told me this, but Grateful Dead, uh, Grateful Dead dream continue. Or Grateful Dead fantasy continue one more day, you know, because um, he wanted to stay in the city and see Jerry Garcia band. That's why he moved there. That's what he told me. So he expressed to me. And like I said, I could totally understand that. So I was there, too. And uh, so in saying that, he also he wanted to show he, by his words, he wanted to show gratitude. And he said, listen. You know, when you come to the Warfield shows, I always get this one particular table in the Warfield. I get there at 5 a.m. I think he, he used to get there and be first in line and just sit on Market Street all day long until, you know, 6 o'clock at night when they it, would open up. It wasn't, exa it wasn't exactly 5 a.m. It was more along the lines of 2 p.m. Sometimes oh, okay. it would be better. like we, we would compete with like it was like maybe 10 people there that would always try mm -hmm. to be the first in line. And so like, you know, it started off as three o'clock and then somebody would show up at 2.45. And, you know, by the end of it, we were showing up sometimes at like 1 p.m. But it, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like the back in the day when we used to wait for Grateful Dead tickets at like the ticket Tron right box office. Yeah, we would yeah. wait from the night before or five in the morning. But to see Jerry, if you wanted to have your spot, you had to show up like one or two o'clock and then yep, you just it was general mission on the floor. Yep. Yeah. Well, so. and the, well, he, so, you know, he said, I always get the same table. It's the thing I do. Um, and, I'm, and, and you're always welcome to come hang out with me there. I'm like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Great. And so sure enough, I mean, it couldn't have been too long for everywhere. It was, could have been that month. I don't remember 1993 shows that much, but, um, I went through the Warfield. Jerry always came on stage at, let's just say, 20 till 8, you know, 7.30. He'd make us wait for 10 minutes. Well, <laughs> you know, I would come in. I, I came in at, like, closer to 8. You know, the place is already shaking. People are dancing. The dreadlocks are swinging. And I don't know what it was, but I looked clear across the floor because I was looking for him, you know. I went onto the floor. I had to sneak on the floor um, and, instead of the, being up in the balcony. Anyway, I'm making the story too long. But um, I saw him from clear across the floor in the dark, people dancing like crazy as they do at these things. And he's looking right at me and he, and he, point, he points to the chair next to me he's, and he, he's like, come on over here. He gestures me to come on over. I'm like, wow. So I go over there and, you know, I sit down at the table and it's like the best seat in the house, the best weed in the house for <laughs> sure is being smoked. I mean, this table became kind of legendary. I mean, you had Bob Snodgrass and Maria come down and smoke. I remember smoking out of the dragon there. I remember Dan Healy swung by at one time. 
And not to mention, like, pretty much all the good fucking indoor weed, you know, that made it to San Francisco for these shows would somehow make it to this table, you know, that people would stop by. And uh, it was fucking amazing. Um, <laughs> so the next night, the same thing, and the next night, and then pretty much every night until until Jerry, you know, kicked the bucket and said goodbye to us, you know, I hung out with Gabby at the at the Warfield at his table, and it was amazing. It was like a bar right in front of it, and just a few, just a perfect view of the fat man up there, just rocking it out. It was amazing. Like I always tell people who weren't around this, I, I would give I would give like a right hand almost for just one more night there, you know. And like I don't really would want to do that, but. It's like that. Yeah, I would do anything. I'm sure Gabby feels the same. One more damn night to work for it, I would do I, anything, you know? I would at least give a stub of my finger like like Jerry had lost his. I would take a little <laughs> piece of my finger off. That would be an easy trade. Yep, I'd do that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That sounds legendary. Let me Let me ask one quick question. I'm sure there was some incredible different samples of weed going across that table over the years. Were there any particular standouts to either of you? Well, I mean, mostly it was B. Gabby's weed, you know, that was the best at the table. I mean, when other weed would show up, it would be like, I mean, you know, all those people I mentioned, they came by because they knew that he had the good weed there. You know, like if they were going to come back behind the stage or make their way across that floor, you know, they were going to, they were going to come to that table. People just knew when the word got out and, you know, Gabby was always so generous with his weed and, and like, um, you know, always wanted to turn people onto it. So a lot of people did, did get turned on to it and they swing by the table, you know, there was one famous herb that I don't think I used to get it at the Warfield, but I used to get it like on grateful dead tour on the West coast that to this day, I can remember the taste and the way it looked and, um, was the Big Sur Holy Weed. Oh, yeah. And and they had which a one, skunk though? and they had a haze. They had the skunk there and they had go. the haze. I know and which both, one you like. Both, both of them were out of this world. And they were. I remember, like, at the way I found that weed was the family that was selling that herb, they used to sell it a quarter ounce at a time. I think it was, like, 125 bucks for a quarter yep. ounce on on dead tour and kind of similar to the stories that you tell about the the, the skunk and the, and the chem dog i used to just buy it all up you know like they wanted to sell it as quarters and i was like fuck it you know i didn't buy that shit it the best weed ever and then yeah. kind of similar to the story with the chem dog is only family and friends would get that weed you know because <laughs> it was already too expensive and too rare like this wasn't the type of weed that you went and sold to random people that you didn't know on the deadline. Exactly. You went to share it with your friends, you know, and you would wait and be exactly. patient until you bumped into them, you know? You know, it's funny. See, you, you see, you have no good memory. You remember the Big Sur Holy Weed, though. You remember those two, Skunk and Hayes. Sometimes people I, bring that up. And I mean, they always get those I, cheap, I just have you know? holes. I just, I just have holes in my memory. It's, it's not complete. And, you know, I just want to... A lot of people are telling this story to the best of their ability. And I don't think that this is an issue of like, people are lying and making shit up and like, you know, not so dog. He believes the story. And like you said, how you realized you made a mistake on something you said on the other podcast, like when I was teasing you and making, this is what it's gonna be like for everybody. And you know, we're, all, we're dealing with something that happened a long time ago, you know, not so dog puts it, you know, put it pretty clearly. None of us knew how important this history was going to be. So we didn't keep detailed notes, you know, and, <laughs> you know, sure. I don't think you or I or not so dog, there's really nothing to benefit from the little mistakes that are being made or discrepancies that are being made in these stories. You know, it's, it's not like by saying this, this person's going to make a, have a big payday. It yeah. doesn't look like anyone's trying to do that, you know? So no. I think we should have healthy debate about what we think the story was and enjoy telling the stories. Me particularly, I enjoy listening to the stories from you guys because your memory, even if there's some mistakes, it's so much more detailed than mine and it's 
for me, it's the most beautiful thing to hear you t- tell the stories. Oh, so. sweet. I love that. I love you, brother. I'm so glad to hear that. I love you, too. I'm glad, I'm glad that we're able to even, like, share the story, you know, because it's a miracle that any of this, like, it's like I always tell people, you know, 30 years later, um, just from my viewpoint of all this, it's it's like it's a unique thing to be able to look back and kind of see the whole thing, at least from my perspective, you know, and and just to watch, see, like, kind of appreciate, like, all the little twists and turns, all the little nudges in a certain direction, you know, and, and to, like, it all just kind of seems like, well, what the hell's going on here? Like, it seems like a, like a divine intervention almost, you know, and it is. The plant, you know, it has a divine intervention. It definitely does. It definitely somehow works with us, whether we understand it or not, we don't. And, and, you know, it's amazing that, you know, she's still here and, and that all the different people and none of us knew each other. That's the other thing. Like, so, you know, like Gabby knew Greg, but I didn't know, I never even heard of the guy, you know, it's like all these little details. I'm like, if you take one little piece of it out, she may not make it. And she's here. And then we're here still. And we get to talk to each other now, you know, now, you know, we all get to know each other, everybody who was involved with what happened back then with this particular plan or a few plants. And to me, it's just like, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard. It's difficult to explain it to someone to give them the perspective that, you know, like I or Gabby has, you know, to see like, you know, like what's really going on here. You're like, you know, this wasn't about anything except for having the best fucking week. That's all it was. There was no motivation. So, you know, not so dog and, and Gabby, you know, like he said, are correct. It's like, um, you know, like, you know, it's, it's just, it, to me, it's just, it's just amazing that we can still tell the story, you know, and that we can all talk about it amongst each other. None of us saw it. And like, the, like those guys said, like, we weren't like, this, none of this was part, none of this was important. It had no importance whatsoever. Like not one of us, you know, I know Gabby and I, we didn't, we never like even once considered like, you know, what's going to happen 30 years later, you know, it's just like, let's smoke the best weed today and laugh and have a good time and go snowboarding or skiing and watch Seinfeld like we used to do, you know? And so that's what it was all about. And so it's all so, so delicate in that sense, you know, like nobody was trying to get to the finish line. We were just trying to, you know, have the best weed in our pocket, which we did. And maybe that was what, that maybe that's how it works. The plant gives us what we want and we give the plant what it wants and look at us all surviving, you know? That's, I think that's still the goal today, right? So very uh, full circle. I, I want to quickly take us back a sec because you, you, I, I agree with Gabby. You're doing such a good job with this story. I want to quickly rewind a second and ask Gabby a question. Tell us about the Francine. This is one that a lot of people are interested in, mostly because when that trade for the skunk eventually went down, that was what those VO, VA dudes were more interested in. And I think a lot of people are sort of like, what, like, why was it the Francine? Like, what was going on there? And I think in the first episode, Jason said that it was sort of like a Northern Lights thing, but I'd love to hear from Gabby. Like, what was your take on the Francine in terms of like the flavor, the effect? How do you remember it? Okay, so... I hope this story isn't disappointing to everyone because, you know, it, it, the ending isn't so great. But so the Francine was just bag seed that I had acquired on Grateful Dead to it. And I have no idea what it was. You know, we could speculate that it was Northern Lights just based on what we thought we knew, which was limited about, you know, other stuff like that. And, you know, photos we had seen, but it was bag seed. And, uh, and you know, I think Not So Dog mentioned this, you know, before in, in multiple podcasts. A lot of the stuff that was done back then, it was accidents. You know, and, you know, you, you get a bag of weed, you find a couple seeds. Back then, you kept them. Today, most of the time, if I find bag seed, I don't keep it. You know, unless it's like something truly amazing, but you know, I, I don't try to plant accidents. Like, but that, that back then, that's all I had. I didn't have access to clones. This was in a highly secretive New York market. You know, so at, at the time, I didn't really have anyone. Uh, I forget what his. I think that he goes by Weasel. I think they, they somebody named him Weasel, which. Could be the only name that's worse than Staten Island. 
<laughs> I mean, like, I felt bad about Staten Island, and I, and I found out they call him Weasel. I was like, oh, shit, this could have been much worse. He was he was growing some seed-grown stuff that, that he had, uh, you know, from bag seed that he collected as well. From, like, we went to a, a dead show at RFK, and I don't know if you guys heard of the RFK, but he had the RFK 1, 2, and 3. Three different females that he kept from seed that he found there. But, you know, I, I wanted to try to wow. get something else from seeds that I had. I had been going to a lot more shows than he did. And, um, you know, I, uh, I felt like I could uh, maybe find something nice out of my seed. And what I did what was I named, every si I named every single one of my seeds a girl's name. Okay, even this is prior to knowing what their sex was, just as like positive affirmation, everything had a girl's name. I like that. Okay, and and so you know, I had Francine, I had Irene, you know, Michelle, whatever, you know, just like just because I didn't want to name them one, two, three, I wanted it to be more personal than that, you know, so I gave them like girls' that. names, and um, the Francine. Ended up being the best of those seeds that I planted. It was really, I think partly what was attractive to it was it was a very easy plant to grow. It used to put out really big, chunky buds. And at the time, you know, we were growing organically. And it was way hard to get those <laughs> results. It, it was hard to get really big, chunky buds when you were growing mm -hmm. organic in a container, particularly with the limited knowledge that we had at the time. So the Francine was a really easy plant to grow. I think it had like a mildly fruity slash hash plant type taste. And uh, it was really impressive to look at. You know, kind of like the market today, how the visual look is so important Back then, you know, I was able to sell the Francine based on how it looks. Now, when I think about it compared to all the other weed that we had gotten after and all the weed that we have today, it's not on that level. It's not some, I mean, I wish I had it just for, you know, posterity and, you know, to say I've mm -hmm. had this strain for as long, you know, but it really wasn't as good as everything else that we got. And it used to have a problem getting moldy. You know, so once I started having, pro because the buds were so dense. Yeah. You know, so. They were very wet, too. I remember. Away from growing it. Yeah. So, I mean, now the best part of the story about the Francine was that's how we got the chem dog. Right? Like, he was so impressed with it. I hope I can say his name. Because um, I just did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what his stage name is. Do we need to edit that shit out? Oh, uh, he doesn't have the stage name. <laughs> He's the most paranoid motherfucker I ever met in my life. So he doesn't even have anyway, a stage God. name. Hey, okay. We could just say yeah. We could just say if that's his real name. We could just say that. My memory is garbage. His real name probably isn't even. It is. Well, I mean, it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, if you hear this, this is Jason. We've been looking for you for 26 years. Where are you at? Come on now. <laughs> just kidding. He's not listening. I'm sorry. I just. I'm sorry. I just outed. You. I'm sorry. I just outed you. I'm only sorry. I can't see the look on his face if he actually heard that. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Gabby. Don't worry about that. Damn. Now I got a fear for my life. So, <laughs> okay. So something else about the Francine was, I used to have a a bubbler, Bob Snodgrass custom made a bubbler. Oh, that yeah. it said Francine on it. And that was the only herb that I ever smoked out of it. And when I stopped <laughs> growing the Francine, I stopped smoking out of that bubbler. Never used it again. And luckily, one day I found a, some girl. Her name was Francine, and she was a smoker. And I was like, yeah, you need to have this. I so love I, it. I just, I just gave it to her because her name was Francine. And... Yeah, I was like, if not, it's just going to sit in the drawer forever. I'm never going to use it. Now, That's... Francine can can use it forever. And so Yeah. 
right there, that story encompasses why I, I, I just adore you. Because you're, you're so fucking generous. And, like, that pipe, you could have carried that all the way and never smoked out of it again. You know? A lot of people would have. You know? It's part of their life. But to give it to someone like that, that's I, I love that about you. That's very, very cool. So, so you want to hear something funny about you saying how generous I am? Mm-hmm. Not so, dog. In his previous podcast, he said how stingy I was. He was like, I'm super stingy. He was talking about, he was talking about the chem dog, and he, he like mentioned it like three times that like huh. I just didn't give everybody the chem dog. You know? Well, yeah. And what I pointed out to him was I gave it to my friends. I gave it to my group. Yeah. You know? Like I gave it I gave yeah. it to you. I gave it to him. I gave it to others too. So like just because I didn't like stand on a street corner peddling chem dog clones. Doesn't mean like, <laughs> you know, mm. I was stingy, you know, no. I, I, you know, no. you said before, you know, I like to share my weed and, you know, Francis yeah. puts it out to the universe. Staten Island's a stingy motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so many incredible details around this short period of time. I'd love to quickly check in on a few of them. I'm not sure if Jason said it earlier, but when you guys had that initial first meeting, did you have any chem dog with you at that time or not yet? It's funny that you asked this question because in the previous podcast, Jason said that I had a little chem dog during this encounter. And like when I was listening to it, I texted Jason. I'm like, you're a motherfucking liar. <laughs> you know, because, and you know, it, basically I was just making a point that like, it's possible for any of us to get this story wrong, right? And Jason made a mistake when he was telling the story, and he said that I had the chem dog when we first met, but the reality is I got the chem dog after going to New York, and I got the VA skunk, and I traded the skunk for the chem dog. So I'm not sure what year it was. I think it was 93, like you said earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, so like Jason's connection to getting the chem dog is pretty crucial. You know, he likes to give me all the credit, but I can turn it around and give him the credit because um, chem dog, you know, G, he would not have given me the chem dog if I didn't have something he really wanted like the skunk. Yeah, I wanted to quickly ask you about that. Like, firstly, how did you meet Greg? And then as a follow up. Was he holding out because he knew the chem dog was so good and he wanted to trade? Or he, he, was he just like a recluse dude and just didn't really trade? Um, no, he was willing to trade, just not the chem dog, because he knew it was super valuable that he was the only one had it. But, you know, I lived in California. He was mostly working it on the East Coast, so he didn't see me as much of a threat. And like, because when I lived in New York, he didn't want to give it to us, you know? Mm. But, um,. So, did you meet him through Klopp and that, or did you manage to meet him some other way? I did. I, I met him through Klopp. Wow, okay. So, like, that, that's another thing is, like, people discount Weasel or Klopp's, you know, place in all of this. You know, I, I know they do, but, like, if it wasn't for Klopp, I don't meet Chemdog, and none of this happens either. And it, it's funny, because, like, you know... People give you, Jason, and Klopp shit, saying, like, they're making up this story. And, but, and you know, it's like he was, he was critical in me getting it. I wouldn't have got it. And so were you. If I didn't have the skunk, Greg was being tight. Greg was the one that was fucking cheap, not me. I, Greg was being stingy. I had to have something to trade. He wasn't going to just give it to me. You know, yeah, finally, I mean, when I had something that good to trade, he did it. Yeah. Do you remember, I don't know if you've ever even told me this, but do you remember the first time you ever smoked Chem Dog? Yeah, it was with Chem. It was with uh, G, Chem Dog. Was it like before was you house. moved out or before you moved out or yeah, during that time when you? Yeah, I think I had moved out already. I had moved out in 91 and that's oh, like okay. when he had first got it. So it was like on a oh. visit to New York or, you know. Oh. And what was it like? Was he was he growing it really good back then, or was he still figuring it out? Man, I hate to throw people under the bus, but like his grow setup, in my view, was pretty pathetic. It was like, I mean, 
he had this garden called the Emily's Garden. Are you guys familiar with it? No. Okay. It's I'm a not. prefabricated hydroponic garden, which is just like a little reservoir with a lid on <laughs> top with like four holes for like baskets or rock wool cubes. And then it's like deep water culture. You just like have a, a air stone in there. Oh. And, you know, and that's how he was growing the chem dog. And one part of the story that I like to tell is he called it the chem dog. He used to say, you can't grow it organic. That's why it's the chem dog. <laughs> and at the time, I was the biggest organic snob there was. You know, like, if you were to give me a pound of hydroponically grown weed that was the best ever, I would just, like, turn my nose to it. I was, I was just a snob. And so I tried to grow it organic, and we did grow it organic. And, you know, it barely survived before harvest. You know, it was, like, almost dead by the time it was time to cut it. You know, it's such a hard plant to grow, particularly organic. And then... And I told this story on the other podcast too, but I think it's important for me at least. I had this moment where um, I read something in a pamphlet from a company that was selling hydroponic nutrients. And what it said was organics are mineral compounds that contain carbon and need to be broken down into their more common mineral form before they can be uptaken by the plants. And minerals are the building blocks of all life on the planet. And when I read that, I was like, oh, shit. Like, maybe I should try growing using minerals. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I never turned back. You know, so now I believe, mm -hmm. you know, if you're growing in a container indoors or outdoors and you're trying to, you know, put organic, you got your work cut out for you. You know, it's not yeah. really, and, and generally I don't think you get as good of a quality. Now I add organics to my mineral nutrition. You know, I'll add some seaweed, I'll add some other organic additives, but the base of what my plants eat is mineral nutrition. And you know, there's like a big thing right now where people are trying to do living soil indoors. They're like, this is no till indoors. I'm like, bro, that's just like, <laughs> What a stupid thing to say, in my opinion. <laughs> no offense, to, you know, to the like really, you know, popular growers that are doing that. But saying that you don't till indoors, like, how are you going to fucking get that tiller indoors anyway? Oh, you man. Know, just, yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. I want to quickly ask you before I forget. In the first episode, Jason was talking about how when you were growing organically, you had like these really sort of cutting edge methods for the time. And what was it? The vat, like the, the living compost tea. Tell me about that quickly. It, it, it was cutting edge and crude at the very same time. Like, yeah. you know, I used to have a couple of trash cans that I would fill up with organic fertilizer. There'd be one that would be for guanos. You know, so I'd make guano teas and it would have some seaweed in it and stuff like that. And my logic was I never let it get more than half empty. And it's always being aerated. And so I thought like it was kind of like a starter for like yeast, like for sourdough. You can't get right. rid of it because that's what you got all the life in that thing. So you always want to just like do it halfway. And I would literally keep this vat going for years. And if I moved from one location to another, I would like mm -hmm. take the starter with me, you know? And then the other thing that I tried doing, which was super disgusting, was in another vat, and I had to do this outside eventually because it was so fucking gross. Um, I would put food scraps in the water and, you know, just aerate it and agitate it. And then I would water that to my plants. So it was pretty disgusting stuff. When I, when I started scooping one teaspoon per gallon of mineral fertilizer, you know, people are like, hydroponics, that shit's so dirty. I was like, you think so? You should see this organic <laughs> shit I'm dealing with right now. You know, yeah. like fucking blast of yeah. ammonia. Like, so. And if the, if the pump, if the aerating pump would die, so you had a power outage, I, don't, I know Gabby's the same way. The first thing you think about is the vat. 
because it would just be a matter of you know hours before you'd start to smell the decay of a back or a bacteria. And I knew that because I would take my hand and stir it up. I would same thing. Gabby taught me this, and this is what I did, and it worked amazing. Like I, sometimes I'm like, maybe I should do that again. But I would take my hand and stir it up because it would be a lot of sediment on the bottom. And then if you know, if you like, you know, how you're working, you always got little cuts on your fingers. They would get like infected in seconds and like get all red. You know, like oh shit, the vat's hot. It's ready to feed. You know, and same thing. Always would take it. You know, take half the trash can. And, and, you know, hey, Gab, you remember the other day I told you about your buddy who took that horticulture class with you in Santa Rosa? Well, that the second thing he mentioned was the vat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's it funny. I was going to mention that before, how we were talking about how small world it is. And you run into mm -hmm. one of my college buddies when you're just yeah. around. What a crazy small world. What a small world. Can I can I bring us back for one second? I, I I love that point about how Gabby you mentioned that um you know in a sense the chem dog coming out to the east coast could equally be attributed you know to to skunk Vieta Jason, and I remember in that first interview I did with him he made a comment and he said you know this this guy was really impressive you know he was a real good networker, and I guess it I just want to sort of confirm because it sounds pretty impressive that like you were able to mastermind this plan to get the chem dog through the, through the skunk trade. Had you been thinking about, like, how can I get this chem dog off Greg for a while, or was it just like a spur of the moment thing? And you, Oh, yeah. Greg didn't want to give it up. You know, he, yeah, he, he didn't want to give it up. So. so then run us through how the trade went down. How did, how did it all go down logistically? Well, so I don't have the exact details of... Like, I don't remember the exact conversation that made it happen, but I think Jason got it a little bit wrong, but again, it doesn't like change any of the story as, at all. So what happened was, uh, our buddy that we're not supposed to say his name from Virginia. Well, how about we, how about we call him not so does that work? <laughs> that works. Let's just call him. It's fine. We'll call, <laughs> we'll call him not so I think that's way funnier. Um, he came out to see Jerry at the Warfield. That's when Jason introduced me to him. He saw the Francine and was interested in trading the Francine for the skunk. And, and I do believe we were also always trying to get the Beatrix choice, which I don't think we actually ever got. We did um, not. But, uh, yeah, so he wanted the Francine and he wanted to trade for the skunk. And then somehow I arranged to trade the skunk with Greg for um, for the chem dog. And that's how I got it. And I, um, I went first to New York City where I met not so late <laughs> and, tra and traded him the Francine for the skunk. And I believe he gave me a couple of clones, which I took up to Massachusetts and I traded one of them for, I think I got a couple of clones of the chem dog from G. And then I went back down. I did leave one with Klopp because again, if it wasn't for him, none of this happens. And um, then I drove West and I, you know, I told the story on the other podcast as well. I had it in a Burger King cup with a lid at two Burger King cups, one with the skunk and one with the chem dog. And, you know, when I was driving down the road, if a truck was coming by or if I was scared of police, I just put the lid on the cup. And when that <laughs> wasn't happening, you know, it was getting sunlight through the front window and then like whatever light I could give it in the hotel room to get that shit across country. So, I mean, that's the, the short story. I don't know if you want to ask any more questions for me to, make it more detailed but no that that's incredible so that oh i got one last quick question and then i want to start talking some more about the skunk but i heard mixed reports about some people say oh you know weasel was the head of that new york crew and then other people are like no it was jj he was the head who was sort of the head honcho in your eyes well i wasn't there right so like you know i, I certainly wasn't the head honcho because i wasn't there you know, and JJ, he used to buy the weed from Klopp. This was prior to him growing. 
you know, JJ was the sort was the connect to get rid of it. So I mean, I don't think anyone any of us ever thought of us as the the leader or the kingpin, <laughs> you know. But but Klopp or Weasel was the one that you know started all this stuff getting grown on Staten Island. I mentioned before he should probably be called Staten Island because he lived there longer than me. And, <laughs> um, but whatever. At this point, I'm going to embrace the shit. <laughs> nobody, nobody would try to take that name away from me. I'll sue them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and so he also gave it to a couple of our Staten Island friends. So, you know, if I had to answer your question, I, I would say yeah, it was Weasel that is really responsible for all that growing on Staten Island. And he was the first person that I ever saw growing cannabis indoors. Now, I, I can tell you that story briefly. Um, another one that I told on, on this other podcast. But, um, so me and my, it's like an old girlfriend that I had at the time, were literally sitting outside of a subway station on Staten Island. There's like a few like, you know, trains on Staten Island. And we had just like come back from, I think, seeing a dead show at the garden or something like that. And so we're like sitting on the street, like on the curb, smoking weed right outside of this train station. And Weasel's like, hey, what are you doing down there? And we're like, uh, he's like, you're smoking weed? And we're like, yeah. He's like, oh, well, come up here and smoke it with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like he smelled some good weed. He wasn't used to seeing weed like that. Okay, like I, I believe that was the first time he ever encountered kind bud. And so we showed him this weed that we were getting on dead tour, and he was like, "This shit's grown indoors. Like you can grow this indoors." And we're like, "Yeah." And that was the point where he got inspired to grow weed. And I remember, like, he first, like, dropped a couple of seeds in a 10-gallon fish tank. And his, like, cat used to dig it up all the time, you know, before he, like, made it, like, more secure. And then he event eventually was growing with just normal T5, or not T5, like, T8, like, the regular fat tube fluorescence in his closet. And that was the first time, even though we had gotten Kind Bud and Indoor on tour... That was the first time I ever saw indoor growing. And that was the moment like, you know, I inspired him to start it. And then he inspired me to like stop being a, a gypsy to get a house <laughs> where I could grow weed too. <laughs> okay. And so that's when I got an apartment in Brooklyn. And that's where I grew my first weed because, um, I was inspired by uh, <coughs> by Mike seeing that it could be done. Wow, that's a cool backstory. I, I would love to hear. Tell me about you got the skunk to California and you harvested it the first time. I want to hear both of you guys' opinions slash recollections of what was that first skunk crop like when it was your own homegrown. I mean, to this day. To this day, people call me up or message me and ask me about that weed and tell me that it was some of the best weed ever. So a very respected breeder out here, his name is Shiloh, and he has a, a seed company called Shiloh Massive Genetics. So I have, um, I have some of his genetics. You know, I was doing some nursery work and I have some of his genetics. And I asked him, I was like, hey, do you want copies of this stuff? You know, I just sent him a message. I wanted to know, like, hey, I've got some of your genetics. I don't know if you, if you still have it, if you want it. And his response to me is, do you have any of that VA skunk? <laughs> and I mean, like, none of, I was like, and I said to him, I was like, you heard the podcast? Because I had just done this other podcast. And he's like, oh, no, that was just the best weed I've ever had in my life. So, yeah. I think we all I think we all had that same you know, the same feeling about that herb is that that was some of the best weed we ever smoked in our life. Like to to grow it, 
was way better than growing the chem dog. You know, it was an, you have to remember, like, we weren't that skilled growers. Like Jason earlier said, you know, it was the best indoor weed he ever smoked. I mean, there wasn't a lot of really good indoor being grown. There wasn't a lot of knowledge on how to do it. It was still a pretty, pretty new thing. You know, I think about it now, like a lot of the shit that we were doing, it's like, it's amazing that we got the results we did. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it it, it, you are, it was it was it was like that 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 super skunk the number six it it was it, I, it's hard to it's hard to like explain to someone these days like how amazing it was like it's it's difficult especially when they start talking about you know skunk itself you know I mean this stuff was more skunky than skunk you know it was it was it was incredible you know and the high was perfect you know it wasn't it was like a it wasn't very thing. it wasn't very strong yeah yeah it wasn't overpowered the Kim dog was like you know. I can't, I'm just going to stare at the wall and drool. Whereas the super skunk was what you smoked all day. You could do your thing. You could go do your errands, you know, run to the store, whatever you got to do, you know, but the flavor and the other, and you know, the thing that the super skunk and the chem dog and probably many other strains, but at least those two have in common is like every single time you smoked it, you got stoned. There was something about it where you couldn't really build a tolerance. I mean, we were smoking bong heads, bubblers and fatties and the shit all day. And every single time it just hits you just right. I don't really think there's a lot of herb like that, in my opinion. You know, there's not a lot of herb that just hits you just right every time. You know, and Kim Dog is definitely on that list, and Super Skunk was too. And I wish that you know more people could enjoy it, but it was all about that. It was so good. It was so good. Easy to grow. Uh, it just gave you a lot. Big yielder. You know, I mean, it did stretch out a lot, like the sour diesel does. But um, you know, sticks of weed. You know, just tons of sticks of weed. It was amazing. That's beautiful. And I know that there was two iterations of the Super Dog. Can you tell us about the first one, the the original Chem Dog Cross Super Skunk seeds? How did they come about and what were those seeds like when you grew them? Um, well, there was many iterations of the Super Dog. You know, there were many, you know, we were trying or what I was trying to do and this was um me and not so dog, we were trying to make crosses that had that had chem dominance. You know, like we we tried to cross everything we had, hoping hoping that we could get. I mean, we obviously you know we wouldn't have crossed it with everything we had if we didn't want diversity, right? But yet we really wanted something that had chem traits and that grew better than the chem dog because it was such a difficult plant to grow. And I had gotten seeds from Sensi and we had gotten the super skunk from Sensi based on the fact that the, the DA skunk was so good. We felt like this is the best thing, you know, to buy from Sensi in order to cross with the chem dog. I don't know what year this was. And I do know that there's been a bunch of confusion over whether like what, what we made to cross the camp, the super dog with. But like at the time I was dead set against using any seeds that, you know, although, you know, everything we did was made from bag seed. I would never germinate purposefully something that I knew that was grown like from a herm, right? <laughs> so we tried to buy seeds from Holland because we wanted true, a true male that we could cross with the chem dog. And the super skunk was the obvious choice. We wanted to get that shit back. And, um, you know, that's how we did it. So we got the, the seeds from Sensi. You know, Sensi seeds, you couldn't count on many things, but one thing you could count on is if you bought the super skunk, that shit looked exactly like the catalog. We used to like grow the flower and then hold the, the Sensi seed catalog up against the buds and be like, yeah, that's it. You know, it was, it was incredible. And so we crossed those males with the dog and everything else we had many times. And I tried to do inbreeding with the chem dog. So the first time, um, you know, we did it, you know, we called it the, the super dog and then we crossed it back to the dog again. 
and did it again. I think we did it three times. And honestly, the, the skunk genetics was so dominant and our knowledge of selection was so limited that I never got anything that was like what I wanted. You know, there was a ton of great things that, you know, the stuff was, was nice, but it wasn't, I never produced what I wanted. Ah, can I quickly ask, I could be wrong here. I, I thought the the very first iteration of the super dog seeds was the VA skunk onto the chem dog. Am I incorrect? Was it actually the first iteration was just the sensi seeds and it never had the VA skunk in it? Gabby, yeah, what I, he's I asking that. about is when you made the seeds when you were over at a water trough, you know? And so I answered that question already when I said <laughs> I wouldn't do a herm, right? And the the super skunk, the VA skunk that we had was a female plant. Yeah. I wanted to do what, what I considered legitimate breeding. And to me, breeding with seeds that could potentially have hermaphroditic traits wasn't legitimate breeding. So we had to get ourselves males from a reliable source in order to make any of this stuff happen. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I can appreciate that. You wanted males to work with. So, exactly. Gab, and, we, and like this part, yeah. you know, who knows? So, Gab, when you were over at Water Trough, um, and you may not totally remember this because it was kind of a blip in your, mem you know, like in your timeline, but you actually had some NL5 uh, hay seeds. And I don't know exactly what you so did. I'm not going to. I, I, you, I, I you probably purchased that at the same time. Yeah. This was like 1997. Yeah. Okay. And you, you had, uh, what happened is you had bought those. You crossed them with either the chem dog or either the super skunk, the number six. I don't remember which one. And then you took a male, you found a male in that. And you did this pretty quick too. I remember that was the one thing. I, looking back now, knowing what I know, I'm like, damn, that happened quick. And then he, you crossed that back with the chem dog. <clears throat> and we started calling that super dog. Um, it was a very small amount of seeds. And I don't really know what you did with them. All I remember is that one time you went out of town and you had harvested these. The first the reason I remember it so clearly is because it was the first time I'd ever seen, you know, cannabis right from seed, you know. And you had that cardboard box thing and you harvest it. And you were calling super, super dog, like super skunk dog. Um, but they definitely had that NL5 haze because we discussed it. I remember sitting in your bedroom in that bathroom where you grew weed and we were, you showed me the pack and, you know, we looked at, we actually had some pictures. You had a catalog, I think, or I don't know how we saw the pictures, but we looked at pictures and you discussed it with me. I was like, you do you, Gabby. But, and then the only thing I remember was when we harvested that or you harvested it, you went out of town and you asked me to go over to the cardboard box and box everything up, you know, like put it in Tupperware's. It was on the lines drying in that box, and it was fucking dank. It was so good. You know, it was a nice blend of super uh, super skunk and chem dog, actually. And, of course, I wasn't familiar with the NL5 haze then, but, you know, I don't, I can't, in my memory, I don't remember seeing much of that in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think all that happened, too, probably. You know, I'm pretty sure that I did get NL seeds, but I remember getting the super skunk seeds because the thing is the NL seeds were almost like an afterthought because, hey, if we're going to go order seeds from Amsterdam, we're not just going to mm -hmm. order one pack, right? Right. And so the, the super skunk was the like main thing that we wanted, you know, and then we picked up some other shit too. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Memory is a funny thing. This is the way I, I remember the story. But, you know. It sounds like you guys it, it, did a lot a lot more extensive work when you guys started working with those Sensi Seeds, Super Skunk Seeds. Yeah. And, like, I did a lot of this stuff with Francis or yeah. Not So Dog. You know, because he had a whole bunch of genetics. You know, he had the Mendo Perps. He had the Maui. He had a ton of shit that we crossed when we did this, you know? And he was the one that I remember coming up with the name Not So Dog. You know, he reminded me of this when we talked. And the reason why the shit, we called the shit Not So Dog, because the original ones, we called them the SD, the Super Dog. The original SD, right? Um, but then after doing it again, you know, one day Francis says, hey, you know what? This is not so dog. And we're like, oh shit. That's what we gotta call it. <laughs> the not so dog. 
because That's because funny. it was great. It just wasn't the dog, <laughs> you know. That's brilliant. That, so, yeah. so tell me, how long were you growing the original skunk six, the VA skunk four, before you lost it? I, I do. I think Jason <laughs> might know better than I. Yeah, I have no I idea. Do. I remember that. I remember that so well. So I guess you would say hmm, if you got it in, you must have got it in 1993. Um, so yeah, we can go back to the beginning. So uh, let's fuck your name. <laughs> so did what I think one not that, so, so much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> we can see that. Yeah, I'm gonna make shirts. Uh, we're gonna. Hey, where's that? Where's not so loved it? Because he disappeared. Exactly. My best friend died in 2002. The last time I saw him was at the funeral. And, you know, like it, we felt like there was law enforcement there and there had there was reason for law enforcement to be at my friend's funeral and saw that and we talked about it. And that was the last time I saw him. That's I just, like, never, never heard from him again, Shit. never saw him again. But anyway, so <laughs> it was the one that came out. But also that night when I don't know what you guys talked about. I wasn't part of the discussion, obviously, but there was some other uh, growers from Virginia. Uh, the night where uh, you guys talked about trading, you know, like talking about super stock. Uh, you weren't there that NFC. night? No, I was How there, but I wasn't there? part of the discussion. Well, yeah. I, I was there. I wasn't part of the discussion. So I was there. and But there was some other characters there from Virginia who were kind of more like, you know, uh, not kingpin like you guys call it, but like more more in control of those cuts than it was, you know. It's kind of like the guy who can maybe get the cuts, you know. Um, but those were the ones that were keeping holding the cuts and they were there too. And, you know, so that's why I was so surprised by all this because I, I don't even know those guys. And I was surprised. I acted like I don't know who they were because I knew that would make them more comfortable. Although I grew up smoking their weed in Virginia, you know, the weed they actually grew. And um, <clears throat> so they actually asked me to ask you, you know, about that. You know, they had been talking about it. You know, they were there. I was there. And they actually asked you. And then they actually asked me. As a fucking kid, you know what I thought about it because that's just how people are from there, and that's how those guys were. And I was like, dude, it's none of my business, you know. I just want to hang out with the good weed, you know. And so that's how it all went down. They agreed to to share that cut, you know, uh, to give Gabby that cut. And I, I guess they would have gotten that cut of that Francine. At least I hope they did. But uh, so <clears throat> um, we had it from that point. Gabby had it from that point on. And he passed it to me in 1995, just right before Jerry Garcia died, you know, like so July of 1995 when I came up to Sonoma County and got a house up there. And, and uh, he told me he would set me up, and he did. Um, when you so, quit, when you we, quit going to see Jerry, right? When you quit Jerry? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> when, you quit on me, to, <laughs> when you decided you don't want to see Jerry no more? Yeah, well, you know, we talked about that earlier. What you meant, what you were saying was is, because you used to always be like, you were hard on the vents, and of course, everybody was, you know, but uh, you're a little bit older than me, too, so, you know, it's easier for you to be in this position, you know, and you said uh, to me, it's like, you know, Jay, can't, Jason, when this whole Grateful, when you're done with this whole Grateful Dead thing, let me know, and I'm going to hook you up with some clones, I'm going to show you what I know, and we'll get you growing, and when you told me that, you were, like, fulfilling my big dream, because <laughs> I didn't really, you know, the whole thing is like Grateful Dead tour, but all the whole thing is like, you know, I want to grow my own weed and sell some weed out of the, you know, my house that I'm growing, you know what I mean? And kind of grow the best weed, you know, the whole thing. It's like the big dream. So anyway, <laughs> we lost the super skunk. Don't really, you know, it's easy to remember like an event that's catastrophic. It's hard to remember like the events that led up to that event. And I do admit that I have a hard time admitting or not admitting, uh, remembering why, like, what had happened up to the point where um, the story. So you had an outlet. It was uh, right left of your toaster oven in your kitchen, and you were having a lot of trouble with it. And it was causing problems in other circuits in the house. Not necessarily your grow room, but, like, you know, your living circuits, so you're like your laundry room and your kitchen. And you were using a vacuum to suck water out of it, and you were convinced that the water that you kept getting out of it had something to do with it. <laughs> so, you know, eventually... And you had me look at it, and I wasn't an electrician yet, but I knew a thing or two, and I couldn't figure it out. And so you had to call the landlord. And so the landlord had to call an electrician, and they also had to come over and check it out. And um, at that point, you had to take down your grow room. You had to kind of box up your grow room, and you had to box up your plants. 
the part I don't remember is how is it that we only had one mother of that? You know, I don't think we really coordinated like, like super like organized on who had what mothers to make sure we didn't lose it. We didn't really think about it much, you know, we just knew we both had it because me and Gabby and it, and it was an emergency like, situation. Not, and it was an emergency and it had been going on for like a week and it had become a bigger emergency. Like, Oh shit, we got to deal with this. You know, and it's hard for people to understand these days. It's kind of hard for me to even express it or anybody probably of like how stressful a situation like this can be, you know, because of the way things are now compared to this could like wreck your whole deal. You know, this could be like the end for you. At least that's our perception, you know? And so he had to put that thing in a box or, along with all of his other mothers and probably had to, I don't remember this, but knowing him, he probably had a crop going and he probably had to chop some shit down, you know, and toss it. But the moms went in a box and <laughs> I don't know exactly what happened, but that's where the super skunk died. And it was, I want to say 1997 or 1998, but I'm, I'm like more like 82% or 89%. Sure. It was actually 1998. Um, and that was it. We lost it right then. I had passed it to someone in Humboldt County. And those people are different. They're up in White Thorn. Oh, man. Shouldn't say that. And Tumble. And they, um, the guy I gave it to passed it to his neighbor. And his neighbor was a friend of mine now. But at the time, she was like super duper private person. And you couldn't, you know, like she didn't come over and hang out when, the, when you know, anybody besides her neighbor was there. Um, so he passed it to her. And, you know, we, we thought we had it for a little while after we lost it, probably in the early 2000s. We thought we had it hunted down when me and her became friends. And then we lost it because she had passed it to someone back in Sonoma County. And then she set up a meeting between me and him and he had lost it too. So, and that was the end of it, but it was 1998 and that was the end of it, you know, and it was a bummer, you know? So, so time, let me say, we were just, let me say something real fast. Yeah. So, you know, you reminded me of this story earlier today and it kind of like brought light to something that, you know, maybe it's going to be upsetting to some people, including not so dog. Okay. And I'm going to talk to him about it. But, so, you know, he asked me when I did the podcast, he said, well, you know, was it the, the Sensi skunk or the VA skunk? And I was like, well, I don't remember, you know, like I, I hadn't been thinking about it. I don't remember. Right. But so now when Jason's reminding me of this, what I'm realizing is that what I must have given Francis and bred with, I know that we bred with it was the Sensi seeds, not the VA skunk. You know, Francis never had the VA skunk because I had lost it prior to ever meeting him. What I want to say is this doesn't make Francis a liar. No. You know, like, you like, you know, a bunch of trolls on the internet are going to, you know, be like, oh, Francis was lying about this. Well, no, it doesn't make Francis a liar. He's just you know, mistaken about something that happened so many fucking years ago. And like, you know, I called it perception, like, he, he knew, he knew, yeah, he knew that we had the connection and, you know, I'm going to go and talk to those guys and maybe do another podcast with them where me and Francis talk about it. And, you know, he has no incentive to make shit up. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit him in any way to say that it was the VA skunk and not the Sensi Seed skunk. And, you know, so, so many people get so worked up about this shit. And I'm just laughing. I'm like, why? I'm like, why does, you know, maybe I could understand Francis caring and you're caring and I'm caring, but like all these people getting so worked up and calling people liars and fakes and that they don't really know Staten Island. And it's just like, it's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy nonsense. <laughs> Well, you know, it is crazy. <laughs> Welcome to crazy. But, you know, the truth is your perspective until your perspective is, you know, larger and or different, you know? And so that's what it is. I mean, yeah, I mean, of course, you know, like nobody here is trying to... And like, that's what yeah, these conversations... Sure, that's yeah. what these conversations do. That's what yeah, these conversations do, right? They change yeah. your perspective a little bit. I mean, like, maybe me, you, and Francis, you know, talking together on a podcast, you know? That's the best, you know. Oh, I got no, I have no attention have with him at all. I just want the you super skunk bag. I don't actually care. Yeah, yeah but we got, we got, we got, we got to, we have to, we have to give up on that one. 
and just yep. make sure that we never lose the chem dog, right? Because like, oh, that's what's what lost do. is yeah. lost. Yeah, you know that, what's lost is lost. Right, that, you know, I don't, I, 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 don't, of... I don't think anyone now. I've seen some stuff that looks similar, you know. So maybe it has enough of the traits in it, and you know, with some of your, your uh, quality selection, maybe we can find stuff that reminds us of it more. But I hope so. You know, yeah, that's the best we can do, folks. You're right. And like I said, there's no disagreement. It's just perspective. You know, of course, like it's nice to be able to talk about it and hear like, like, like make it make sense, I guess, you know, from my perspective, because I, you know, like these things aren't just plants. I mean, well, they are just plants, but they're not just like, they're not possessions. They're friends. They're allies. They're like, they're like my dog, my cat, my kids. It's family. My That's what <laughs> they're family. Yeah, it's family to me. So to find out a, fa- a member of my family's out there somewhere, and I've been missing that member all these years. I mean, it, it's going to affect you if you have that kind of love I do or you do. And so you know, but as you work through it, you understand that like, okay, there's obviously some more stuff here that's not you know make you know it's going to make sense to me at some point, and now it does, you know, and that's good, you know. Not that it's important that it makes sense to me. But it is to me, you know, because like that's how I go to bed at night. Because you know, I remember what happened, and and like it's a shame what happened. It's terrible, and um, it's also a learning time, a learning like a lesson point in my life because this that's shit. Why, you that's lose why it, we don't lose anything else. Away. That's right. Yeah. That's why we don't lose anything else because of what happened there, and that's how I took it, you know. And I and you took it that way too, you know. Like, you know, it, you it, know it was a rough you know, time. You know what the VA the VA what? skunk is to us what, like, the previous generation to us, they used to say, oh, I remember back in the day, there was the Colombian <laughs> gold and the Panama yeah. red, and, you know, ah, like, now, like, gold. <laughs> yeah, yeah th- 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 this yeah. is the Panama red of our lifetime, you yes. know, that famous, the one that got famous away. weed that got away, exactly, yeah. that, like, years later, le- years later, People like Shiloh go, that was the best weed I ever had in my life. <laughs> yeah. You know? I mean, there's a lot of great weed around, but if that one still rolls around your head, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. And the more years that go by, the more it says, you know, because it was that good. It was just that good. People just don't understand. Like, when people are like, oh, it smells stunky. I'm, I just, I want to believe it, but I also roll my eyes because I'm like, you just, ugh. you know, it's like now they have roadkill skunk, skunk spray. They have all these different ways of describing skunk. Back then, it was simple, skunk, because that's what it smelled like. It smelled like a fucking skunk. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. You know, however it happened, it was amazing. And I, I for one, am grateful to have been able to enjoy it and kind of remember it. And, but at the same time, everything that I come across in my life, including anything I make or anything that I enjoy, you know, immensely these days, it always is going to get compared to that, you know, because it's hard not to. It's so unique, you know. So, mm-hmm. and the, you know, the guy who made this number six, I just talked to him, you know, yesterday and the day before, and he heard your podcast and, and, uh, you know, he was, he reached out to me. He's like, you know, those guys, they got some cool stories, but they don't have any of the backstory, you know? And I was like, <laughs> I know, you know? And I, and I told him, Gabby, I said, I said, Hey, I'm one more closer to my, uh, to one of my fantasies. I don't know if I use the word fantasy, but it is kind of. And he said, what's that? I said, I want you me and Gabby sit down and smoke a joint and talk about shit. Talk about weed. He's like, we can make that happen at least. <laughs> so, well, and I told you that earlier. That. I'm glad that you're into it. Yeah. He's an unknown legend, as they say, you know. And, uh, you know, that might change pretty soon here. I'm working on it. But he's a good guy. He means a lot to me, just like you do, Gavin. You know, his, his work needs to be, you know, it should be, you know, kind of recognized, you know, because he wasn't doing it for the fucking fame or the money either. Believe that, you know, in the late 80s. So he was just mm-hmm. like Gabby and I, just trying to have the best fucking weed in his pocket. You know, that's the game. There's no more to it than that. Right. Take a quick moment to sort of ask a quick question, which is... Oh, there's someone else here? <laughs> there's someone else here besides Jason and I? <laughs> there is? Um, Who is it? Do you- I thought we, Jason and I were having a private conversation. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel at all vindicated that... Essentially, the goal of what you were going for with the super dog is essentially the genetic combination that led to sour diesel, as far as we can tell. So we'll have the uh, the sour diesel conversation in a second. But what I was going for 
was something that had the structure and the vigor of the skunk with the terpene profile of the chem dog. And, you know, when the uh, not so dog talked about it in his podcast, he was like, what we were looking for was the high because the chem dog was the most potent weed of its day. And what I, I disputed that. I said, what I wanted was shit that tasted like the chem dog. You know, I've always been like, you know, the potency is nice, but if the weed's that good, I want to hit it twice anyway. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I'd rather I'd rather smoke more of something that tastes like the chem dog than be concerned about whether it was 15, 20 or 30 percent THC. And mm -hmm. I still feel the same today. As far as the skunk, uh, excuse me, the sour diesel. What I believe the sour diesel was, was an accidental cross that Klopp made. You know, I don't believe that it was a breeding project or weasel, I, you know, and, you know, we can talk to him about it, but I didn't make it, you know, and it was out there east with um, JJ and AJ and um, weasel. And, you know, that's, you know, kind of why I assume it is what it is. But yeah, it's just my best guess. That's what I think it is. But we'll have to get Weasel and J, uh, AJ on the podcast and, you know, we'll see what they have to say. Because they, they really were more there at the beginning than I was with that. I, I would say, you know, the way, you know, individuals speculate about what a strain is nowadays, when they have no way to, like, you know, there's no evidence of it. You know, it's just speculation. So, like, if you look at the super skunk and you taste the chem dog and you taste super skunk and then you try the sour diesel. It's, it's hard. I would, you know, of all the speculation, there's only one that I would agree with. And that is that that is probably true. The super skunk and the chem dog, since those guys were growing it too, both of them. And we both know the chem dog harms every time. And the super skunk certainly threw bananas too early. If you even had the slightest uh, lightly, it's been well documented. Many people talked about it. Um, you know, it's pretty, it doesn't take like a large jump of your imagination to say, yeah, that probably is what it is. You know, it came from that area at the same time. But, you know, who wants to get involved with that conversation, argument, or whatever? I, not me, because I wasn't there. And like, a lot of people do. Know, a lot of people, that's, a lot of people are spending their life having that conversation and arguing about it. And I just think it's, it's going to be speculation yeah. to the end of time, you know, and that's, you know, that's right. Yeah. You know, people go, which headband cut did you use? Or which, uh, you know, master cut, cush cut you use? And it's like, I would love to answer you that. But when someone hands you a cut and says, this is the master Kush, I'm, I'm supposed to add on another, you know, adjective or pronoun for you, for the, for somebody out there on the internet. Like, I, I can't do that. Like what it's told to me is what it is. I understand there's more than one cut of headband. I understand there's more than one cut of master Kush. But when someone hands that to you, you know, you know, obviously you're basing your experience with this cut in the past, which I do. I'm not going to rename it. You know, just to suit somebody on the internet who, and the, how they feel about it. You know, I can't do that. And what difference does it make? You know, I, my, I don't mean to be an asshole, but sometimes I ask the question back. Well, how many sour diesels have you smoked? And they're like, well, I've smoked this one. I'm like, so what difference does it make to you? <laughs> you only smoked one. You know what I mean? So keep it as true as it was when it was handed to you. You know, like leave the speculation out, you know, because that's all it is. Or if, you, if your game is speculation, be really clear that that's what you do. You speculate, you know? I think that I think that's a re legitimate thing to do is to speculate as long as that's the way we're putting it and not right. putting too much, you know, into it, you know, and there certainly shouldn't be like heavy drama and arguments over it because we should right. just be saying, yeah, I, have, I really don't know. This is just my best guess. And I'd love to ask, did either of you guys ever really get into or try any of the other clones to come out of G's library, like the uh, the Jeezel or the Snow Dog? I think some of that work was done by Bundy. But did you guys ever try interested in it at all? I've, I've grown the Jeezel out, yeah. What was your thoughts on it? Because it's meant to be the same genetic combo as Sour Diesel, right? It's meant to be like Chem D Skunk. It is, and it, but... I can't imagine anyone would put it on that same level. Of course, not many people have tried the number six, but um, it just didn't do it for me. Um, it was standalone, but 
it's, it goes back to perspective. Like when your perspective is, oh, this has super skunk in it. Well, your your expectations in some areas have risen without you even wanting it to. Your bias has risen without your any you know effort on your part, and therefore it becomes disappointing. You know, unfortunately, you know, just like the mass super skunk, which I've told you about before. It's, you know, I got that sent to me, and you know, I grew it out when G gave it to me in 2006, and I was expecting the number six because that's what I told it was. That's what he said it would be, and I mean, and I believe he thought that that's what it was, but it wasn't, and you know. Who knows? Maybe in some gardens it would have been a winner, but in my garden it was just like a point of disappointment, like a massive disappointment. You know, like ugh. so, couldn't do it. If that makes sense. Yeah, interesting. How about you, Gabby? Did you ever try either of those? I didn't, but what I did try were the other chems, like the chem sister and the chem D, and. I never thought any of that stuff actually matched up. And as a matter of fact, like I told the story, you know, with Francis that I don't really believe that. And I'm saying this with all due respect to Greg, who produced some of the most important genetics of our lifetime. Right. Um, when he says that, like five years later, he popped more seeds from the same batch. And then five years later, he, you know, I question that because like, he only had like 10 or 12 seeds in initially. And if you had 12 seeds of the most epic shit ever, and you just pulled the chem dog out of it, and you lost the chem dog, which he did, yeah. would you wait five years and then five years more to plant those seeds? Like, that doesn't seem like a logical story. You know, and the one thing that chem dog has said many times is that he called the chem dog whatever he was growing at the time. You know, so. I really don't think that those are actually close chem crosses. They might have the chem dog in it somewhere, kind of like the not so dog or the super dog. But um, yeah, I don't believe that's what we were all looking for at the time. I mean, I would say I, I can't disagree with that. I just, I can't, you know, like the Chem D doesn't look anything like the Chem Dog. And like, of course, there's variation right. in F1s, but that's, not that. That's the most controversial shit that I say. That's the most controversial yeah. shit that I say. Well, you know, I mean, I try and, not to get it's into not the really controversial. You just said it's your opinion. It's not controversial. And, you know, you, you, you are a standalone, too. And you get to have your own opinion. You've had a lot of experience with this stuff, you know, just like myself. And, and you know, I, I would agree with you, you know, like. You know, I've told the story a dozen times where, you know, like I saw the Kim sister, the one that I wanted in a magazine picture, you know, in 2006. That's the one I wanted. The Kim sister I hold currently is not the same plant. However, it was handed to me as the Kim sister. So I still call it the Kim sister. Now everybody wants to call it the Bundy cut. I'm okay with that. You know, I kind of know the stack story a little bit on that, but I still just call it the Kim sister, you know. Um, but the mm -hmm. Kim D and especially the Kim one, two, and three, four, they don't, I don't know. You know, they're definitely, like, well, definitely. In my opinion, I would say they're probably related, but not directly related as in the same project right. as the Kim dog. You know? That's what I think. Yeah. But yeah, we'll never know for sure. You know? Interesting. And just... But probably not. <laughs> probably not. To to get a bit of a baseline, I wanted to ask you both, how did... When, the, when OG Kush first came out, you know, in sort of the early 2000s, how did that change your perspective? Did you still think that like the chem dog was the best shit or did you think like, oh, this OG really stands up to it? Like, how did that change things? I definitely felt like OG stood up to it because it's in the same, you know, like range of profile, I guess might be a way to put it, that I am attracted to, you know, as the chem dog, like that deep earthy, a lot of pin pinene, you know, a lot of like similar terps, you know, similar effect, you know. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that, you know, Kim dog wasn't the only good weed around, <laughs> you know, I was happy to hear that, you know, so that's my take on so it. So the way it, my, my take on it is pretty similar is I wish I had made that shit because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying <laughs> to make shit that was similar to the Kim dog, but more robust plants. And, and those plants were it. You know, yep. and, you know, I remember, look, I don't think I was stingy, but I did keep the chem dog close to the vest, right? <laughs> and, 
when it got when it got out, I was a little bummed at first, right? And now when I think about it, I'm grateful for that because because it got out, a lot of great shit was made. You know, not just from yeah. you know Jason and um, the others that have read with the chem dog. You know, um, you know, lots of people got it. However, they got it and made some of the strains that I think are my favorite shit, you know, till today, you know? So, uh, like I said, at the time, I was a little upset when the shit got, you know, completely out there. <coughs> and now, you know, now I don't even have the chem dog. You know, I know I can get it back from Jason and, and others, but um, I'm grateful it got out, you know? So that's kind of my way. perspective on, on that. When I got the Kim dog from Gabby, he told me never give this to anyone ever, you know. And so I did give it to three people, <laughs> a couple of them more than once, you know. A couple, one of them a lot more than once, and uh, you know I'm grateful for that, you know. Um, and I didn't. I the third person I gave it to, I barely knew, and he's probably the number one reason why it's everywhere now. Um, you know, breeding or just clones available. You know, so and it's still hard and to find, that? of course. But his name is Shea Bud, and he runs a company called Seven Hundred Seven Seed Bank. And I was a little high on acid one night, and he came by the apartment to buy some weed, and we started talking about breeding. And I was like, "Man, this motherfucker knows a lot about breeding." And so I was like, "I had this notion just to give him the, the cut." You know, it's like I want to say two thousand six, could have been two thousand five, and, and I never really saw the guy again. I think we talked on the phone, um, but anyway, so that's. And then it went from there to Humboldt County, which they spread it amongst their, their circles far and wide. And then eventually it went to Colorado. Um, and then a guy there gave it to Peabud. And then he was responsible for, for spreading it around. Peabud, Gab, I don't know. If, do you know who he is again? He's the guy that sold the weed to Greg. Yeah, he's one of the guys. Yeah, so he, he, he was uh, coming back into cannabis at the time, I guess you could say. And, um, you know, the connection had been made. And so... You know, that's how that got around. But honestly, at the time, I was like, I was on probation. I was looking at like serious fucking, you know, uh, you know, law enforcement issues that I had had from the bus that I just had when all this started happening in 2014, 15 ish, 15, 16 ish. And but now I look back and I'm like, I'm really, you know, the plant does what it's going to do. Try not to get in the way, you know, and that's that's where we're at, you know, so. She's an amazing plant, and in light of every, all that, and then looking back and seeing like what's available today, what people are in love with today, I'm really glad it happened because it'd be shitty if it wasn't part of that conversation or equation. You know what what cannabis is today, right now. You know, so I'm glad it's there. I agree with you 100. percent That's brilliant. So we've chatted a lot about some of the things in the past, but I'd love to chat a bit about the future. You know, at the start of the episode, you guys revealed there's an exciting collab in the works. Where can people find the clones and, and what can they expect going forward? Well, me and Gab have been talking and, um, you know, it was 30 years ago when we, when we kind of had that fateful day and met and, you know, it's like, where he's at right now, where I'm at right now, it just made a lot of sense. And, you know, we decided after talking and back and forth and going back and forth, I mean, we, me and Gab talk, it's usually just laughing about stories and stuff like that. But every now and again, these things come up. And, you know, Gab's got a good uh, extensive lab library. And like I mentioned, my partner, you know, she has a way to sell clones through her website. Um, we here at Lucky Dog Cannabis and Lucky Dog Seco are going to start selling our own clones. You know, we're going to start uh, selecting other breeder stuff. Um, and so we started talking about all this, and I don't really think it was anyone had to push it. It was just kind of one of them ideas was just sitting there for the taking, and we decided to just team up and we're going to do some breeding collaborations. We're going to do this clone collaboration um, and kind of just work together and share all of our fucking amazing genetics with anyone who's interested in this stuff. You know. So um, I'm fucking beside myself excited. This is like a dream come true for me. Um, I just, you know, Gabby means the world to me. He's had a huge impact on my life and how my life has turned out. And I just turned 50 years old and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm able to, I just, you know, we just had dinner together a month ago. I had to pass through town. Unfortunately, it was for a memorial, but I was able to hang, hang with my friend Gabby and eat a meal. 
for the first time in God knows how long. And it's just like, this is what's so precious about life. This is what the good stuff is, you know? And dinner's amazing and hanging out and conversation, but be able to work and kind of collaborate with, you know, only, you know, Gabby's one of my mentors, you know, like he's someone who means so much to me. Like, you know, we're only a few years apart, but, you know, when you're 17, 20, 19, 20, 21, like those three or four years, that's a, that's all yeah, there is. And, you know, the guy's given me so much knowledge. Of course, he shared the genetics with me. I always will have the respect that he was brave enough to drive that shit across country. I know people who, you know, they pat themselves on the back all day. They don't have the balls to do that, you know? So I have respect for that. And I love my friend Gabby. I respect my friend Gabby. And to be able to work with him in any capacity is like a dream for me. You know, it's like full circle, I guess you, they call it, you know? And so, you know, you can go to, you know, as of tonight, you can go tonight is not when you hear this people, but tonight is as in Friday, May 12th, you're going to be able to go to breeders, direct seed co co dot com and Gabby's library will be available there. Um, and we're going to be collaborating on all this stuff. And, um, you know, so we have like, we don't know what to call it yet. We don't know if we should name it, but, uh, you know, it's a collaboration between two old friends who give a fuck about weed. And I think the whole world who gives a shit about weed is going to fucking love it. I really do. So that's my take on it. Well, I, I appreciate what you said, Jason, and I'll add to that by saying, so um, these other guys from this other podcast, they reached out to me saying that people wanted to hear what I had to say. And I was kind of like, why? You know, I was confused because, I, you know, like I felt like I haven't really done anything with the chem dog or with the skunk in a really long time. You know, that's, that's what Jason has been doing. And, and I've been doing other stuff. I honestly, I, I do, you know, Jason is, is going to get me the chem dog back and we're going to do some breeding together with it. But, you know, for a while, I kind of just wasn't doing that. I had other projects going on and <laughs> when people, when, you know, it was mentioned to me that people really want to hear what I have to say. And oh. I'm this like known person on the internet as Staten Island, you know, I, I, you know, said to myself, you know, maybe people actually do care about what I've done. And like, it was like surprising, you know, like, because I haven't been in the public eye the way others have, you know, I've just been trying to get my work done, you know, and, but, you know, it's also was presented like I'm a super shy person and I don't want to like, like people you know, were scared to ask me, including Jason, <laughs> for some reason, didn't want to ask me if I wanted to do a podcast like this. So I was like, bro, I'm, I'm not that private, particularly about like <laughs> shit that we did, you know, 20 years ago. I'm not really worried about like that coming back to me right now, you know? So yeah. that discussion led into like, hey, you know, maybe people would be interested in a collaboration between, you know, Skunk VA and Staten Island, you know? And <laughs> so that's, you know, that's what we're doing. And like I said, we have been working together for 30 years, you know, doing breeding and other projects. And yeah, you know, took a little time off, but now our, our friendship is rejuvenated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, like I said, Jason was the first person I ever went into business with. You know, he's the first person I ever worked with that way. You know, so it seems like the perfect thing for us 30 years later to get back into it and do another project together. Fuck and, yeah. And, and honestly, when Jason mentioned to me that he wanted to do this, I was honored. Because I consider him the big dog. You know, <laughs> I consider him, he's the one that's doing all this great work with the chem dog for years now. So the fact that he wanted to collaborate with me, it, it was an honor for me as well. Same here. It, it, it's amazing. Are you feeling, are you feeling the love partner? Me? Oh, fuck. Yeah, man. I've been feeling the love. I'm so happy. Yeah. This is, I mean, I've lost so many fucking people that I won't be able to reconnect with in this life to be able to reconnect with you and to be able to have what we have at this very fucking moment it's 
you can't put a price on it. You can't, you can't put anything on it. It's, it's everything to me. This is life. This is what it's all about. You know, I've, I've lost all the right good now, ones. People that are listening oh. are saying right now, people that are listening are saying you guys need to get a room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't need to get a room. Maybe they need to get that, a love. That, like, that, 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 that's, that's, that's what I would be thinking if I'm hearing this conversation about anyone else. Yeah. But, well, you know, I, you know, I don't care. That's the way I, that's the way I feel. You know, I'm Latin, so I'm not scared to express express love <laughs> for my fellow man, you know? Yeah, me neither, so, dude. Me neither. Hey, like, that's what I'm saying. We're lucky to have it. It's so precious. Like, I mean, people say it and they talk about it, but they almost sound cliche. It really is any second you last, you know? And to have people you love and the ones that mean the most to you in your life on a, on a you know, any kind of, like like present basis you know daily or whatever basis it's it's a gift you know and that's how i feel and you know when when we talk about me and you for 30 years and friendship that's what brings it not reminds me it's like all the shit that i've been through in my life and all the fucking shit you've been through the good and the fucking bad that you know that's why we can be who we are right in this moment and we've talked about this you know like you know life will come and kick you in the nuts you know and remind you that you know who you really are. And I know it's done it for myself and I know it's done it for you because we've talked about it. And like, this is the gravy part to me. This is it. And there's a lot of hard work. I ain't scared of hard work. Neither are you, but this is the gravy. You know, this is the, this is the time where we get to enjoy it, you know, and like really be able to put it all in a frame and see it and just be like, fuck yeah. You know? And that's what this collaboration is going to be. You know, it's going to be that. And it's going to be a way to celebrate all this crazy shit, you know? Yeah, I'm corny. I know it. I'm fucking corny, but that's who I am. I'm corny. I'm a big ass corny motherfucker. <laughs> and I'm not that's why Jason and I get along so well. I'm not either. It's true. <laughs> no, what a what a beautiful sentiment. It's all full circle. It's all love. I really like that. And I was gonna just quickly mention, you know, shout out to the the Breeders Syndicate podcast for getting you on. I know both Jason and I have listened to the episode and enjoyed it a lot. And uh certainly not trying to avoid saying the name so i wanted to give kudos to not so and matt for for helping make that happen otherwise we probably wouldn't be chatting right now and i wanted to quickly follow up you know people have heard they can get gabby's clone library in the near future the question is on the breeder syndicate you mentioned you were smoking on the orangutan titties i think we all collectively got a laugh when we heard that one what other clones are you uh, vibing on at the moment gabby what are some of the things from your collection that you'd be excited for people to try so the three strains that I'm most excited about currently are the orangutan titties, which is grease monkey time Skittles. It's extremely Skittles dominant and Skittles is making a big comeback out here in California. At least it, it's really beautiful weed. It actually won the Emerald cup last year for the personal use category and the personal use category. For those that don't know, it's the most, um, the most respected category because it includes everything. So the Emerald Cup, they break everything down by um, terp profile, whether it's indoor, greenhouse, outdoor, they, they break it down to a whole bunch of categories and that's for all the licensed stuff. And then they have the personal use category, which is just like anything goes, anyone can enter and the licensed facilities enter as well. And my buddy Parker Moselle, um, Fino hunted it and entered it into the Emerald Cup and was the winner with that strain. It's extremely rare and it's, it's super nice. So that's one of them that I'm really excited about. The other ones are the Slaps, which is Grease Monkey times Runts. Um, I, just, I just received some flour from a cultivator <laughs> that's just finishing it. And it's just, it's unbelievable. It's really beautiful weed. And then the It's It, the It's It is rainbow chip times gelato. And out here in California, everybody's asking for candy gas. And what I think the um, It's It is, is gas candy. Because it leads with the gas, but there's a little bit of candy there and it has color. So, you know, those are the strains that I'm currently most excited about um, being able to release to the public. I do want to add, since you, uh, you thanked Matt and the Breeder Syndicate, I wanted to do the same thing. Um, I did want to mention them, and I'm, you know, I'm glad it's not an issue, because if it wasn't for them, 
we would not be having this conversation because, you know, that's what convinced Jason that I'm not a hermit, you know, scared to like talk to people. <laughs> and, you know, if, if I hadn't done that podcast, you know, because Jason was like, yeah, you know, like we should, we should do something. I was like, yeah, we should do something like this. Why the fuck not? He's, he was literally there when it began. And one of my closest and, uh, you know, I, I've known him longer than I've known anyone in California. You know, so mm -hmm. when I moved to California, I was scared to talk to people like who lived near me about my growth. You know, so that's why, you know, I lived in Sonoma County. I would drive down to Golden Gate Park to try to find people because I was scared that, you know, local people would know that I grew. So, you know, meeting Jason when I first moved to California, pretty much, you know, maybe a year or two later, it was a, it was a critical part of my life that I, I want to keep fresh in my brain. You know, that's why I like Jason to tell these stories to remind me, you know, of everything. Yeah. Same here, dude. Definitely. Obviously huge junction in my life you know, meeting you in that park that day and for that plant too don't forget about her and the other ones we've been involved with too you know and so it's 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 worth noting for sure even though we didn't care about it too much until lately but straight up it's, it's worth noting i appreciate you uh helping us with this podcast too oh uh, look the pleasure's all mine it's not what we do <laughs> hey, uh, one more little, one but, more little know, stupid story. So, like, get, get well, before you, you before you guy. do, let me just say one thing. I hope this is All just right. part one. Okay, I hope I hope we can do this a bunch more because uh, you know there's a lot more for us to tell. Yeah, I mean, Gabby, you and I talk about it. Like, you know, people may or may we think may find it entertaining just to hear us our fucking conversations we have outside of a situation like this. You know. An arena like this where we just talk about life weed stories and everything else involved you know like yeah this is definitely not the end of that you know I'm, and that you know that's what i was going to say it's like i i told uh and his audience just december um yeah he asked me do you think we'll ever get a chance to talk to staten island and you know i only call you staten island because that's what they call you on the internet just so you know and so you know i'm not going to name drop you if uh if everyone else is calling you staten island um, and then, uh, and then I, was, I told him, I said, Hey, no, he's very private. And then the other day I told you that story and you, you made the fucking, you, you made the funniest point. You said, my name is Gabby. I'm from New York. I'm not private. There's nothing private about me, whatsoever, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, <laughs> I don't know where I got that idea from, but, uh, yeah, what you said makes more sense to me than what I thought. That's brilliant. That's yeah. Brilliant. I mean, it's funny. I used to have a commercial on the radio in Mendocino County and, you know, for my uh, grow shop. And it used to go, hey, what's up? This is Gabby from the Garden Spell. Mendocino's premier indoor garden shop and so and so. And, and like, I put myself out there so hard. I feel like I'm the least private person in the world. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know many people that put them at least that early, you know? I, and to be to hear that, like, I'm this private guy. I was like, man, news to me, you know, like I, you know, and I was really so just blown away that people wanted to hear what I had to say. Yeah. People wanted to hear what I had to say. I, I, um, I couldn't believe it. You know, like when, when Matt from the syndicate called me up and said, you know, people really want to hear what you have to say. I was like, why? <laughs> I, <laughs> Why does anyone want to hear what I have to say? You know, I just, and so it, it's a good feeling. You know, people have said a lot of nice things about me. There's been very little shade thrown in my direction. Um, actually, zero shade thrown in my direction. And, you know, you know, the most respected growers out there like Jason are saying that I grew the best weed he ever saw in his life at the time. You know, like, it's all super nice shit, you know, and. I'm grateful. That's beautiful. Look, and I, I think on when you say, you know, you're surprised people are interested to hear from you, I think honestly it just speaks to one of the points Jason made on one of the early episodes I did with him, which is that, 
you know, fact is more interesting than fiction most of the time. You know, a lot of people have these weird stories about Chemdog on the internet, and I think the real one is actually by far the most interesting. It's always well, it's funny because Matt, Matt from the Syndicate, he had said to me, he said, "What people find so endearing about you was that you didn't flex." And I said to him, "I don't know what I have to flex about." Like, like you know, I, and actually, I corrected him. I was like, you know, there are things that I will flex about. I'm really proud of how many people I taught to grow and inspired to grow, and you know, help take their grows to the next level. And you know, I had the first indoor garden shop in Mendocino County, and I put grow lights on on Highway 101. So when you were driving, you know, from Mendocino County north, you saw. You saw my grow lights in the window, you know, and, you know, so like, I'm proud of that. And that, and that's, that's, that's my flex, you know, like what I did for the chem dog, like maybe I didn't see enough value in it. Maybe I needed other people to like, tell me how important it was for them to, for me to put more value. But I, I always felt like if I did a big flex about the chem dog, that I'd look like an asshole because Really, all I was was the delivery driver and somebody that grew it. You know, like Greg was the one that, you know, grew the seed. And, you know, VA, Jason here, he's the one that made all these subsequent crosses afterwards. And so what's my legacy? I'm, I'm the bus driver? I'm, I'm the, the delivery driver? Like, I just didn't see what my flex was, you know? And I appreciate being told that it was more important than I, I give my, you know, give myself credit for it. I'm still not going to flex, <laughs> you know, I'm still not going to be like, yeah, that's right. This is me. Not yet. You know when I will, after me and Jason put out some legendary shit that changes things and changes the way people think about cannabis, then, you know, maybe I'll flex, but I'm not there yet. You know, Gab, the thing is about flexing, and I don't really understand exactly what that means, but I'll tell you what I think is that just coming out here and, like, talking to people and saying your stories, showing your point of view, that's all the flex is needed. I mean, it's – it's it's to us, it's just our life. We did this, but to people who, you know, may, you know, who are paying attention, I guess, and care, it's fucking amazing. It's a cool story. It's legendary shit. People fucking appreciate you sharing it, you know? That's good enough. Well, I definitely, I definitely appreciate the opportunity. Um, it has made me blush. It, you know, has given me an opportunity to tell some good friends that I really care about them. Having the opportunity to tell these stories and more listen to these stories with my friends like Jason and Not So Dog, it's brought me so much pleasure the last couple of weeks. And then, like, all these people messaging me saying how much they enjoyed the stories and how much they appreciate me. And literally so far I've gotten zero shade, zero hate. It's made me feel really good. And I'm, I'm, I'm super grateful for you guys and for Matt and for not so dog for giving me this opportunity to feel, to feel good. I hope to return the favor. Of course. Of course. Well, before we wrap things up, I want to ask you guys a few quick fire questions as we normally do before we end the episode. So, first one's for you, Gabby. What's the most memorable Turpin profile in your mind? There's two of them. The first one is the chem dog, and then the second one is the the holy weed, the big star holy weed. I can still smell that weed and, and taste it in the back of my throat. And I haven't had it since the 90s. Wow, beautiful. What sort of smells does it have or is it hard to describe? I mean, the skunk was truly skunky. And the haze is like what the original type of haze. When I think of haze, I always think of that Big Sur Holy Weed. So it's everything else that I would be comparing it to that. Because that was my first experience of haze weed. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And Jason, yourself, most memorable terpene profiles. I mean, you know, super skunk for sure. I can't forget it. It's in, uh, same thing. I can feel it in my nasals. I can feel it in my sinus. You know, that coating it does in your sinus. I can still feel that earthy, sharp skunk. Um, I mean, 
I would like to go back a little long further to the Beatrix Choice, that deep uh, grape bubblegum flavor, but <clears throat> it's starting to fade now, to be honest with you. Like, I had it for a long time, so the Super Skunk is still in my mind, you know, the way it would break up into that cotton, it's really soft, much like the sour diesel when you twist it up, it's like, it's not like hard, it's kind of smooshy, you're fatty, you know, it's burned perfectly, it's like that cotton consistency, you know? so for me, it's that. I think if I had to add a third one, it would be the Super Skunk. <laughs> but you know, but I mean, I, I was already stretching it when I when I did two. You know, I, I felt like you asked for one, and I I gave you two. Um, I mean, the that's, big a, Sir tough, Holy that's a tough question, you know. Yeah, the Big Sir Holyweed. Um, yeah, that was just. I rem remember, like, I had gotten a batch of it sent to New York City when I was living in New York and growing it, and it this was outdoor weed, full term outdoor weed, not greenhouse grown. And to this day, I think like, man, that, that weed stood up to anything today. You know, and so that, that's an herb I'd like to, to connect with again. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Well, for the last question, before we wrap up, if you could only have one strain to smoke for the rest of your life, we'll go to Skunk VA first this time and Gabby second. One strain for the rest of your life, what would it be? That's a tough can I answer one. first? <laughs> Go for it. Yes. Can I answer yes, first? Yes, you can. Didn't, didn't you just ask that question? I feel like it's the same answer. answer. Isn't it the same question? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same fucking well, question. Honestly, though, I, I think the Kim Dog, because the effect of the Kim Dog just suits me much better, but it's tough. I mean, it is the same question. Gabby's right, but I would say the Kim Dog, because it works all day long, every day, all night long, all night. It's just perfect for me, you know? I don't even like getting high. For me, I just yeah. smoke a lot of weed so I don't get high. You know? <laughs> for me, it's strictly about the turf profile of the chem dog. That's just the shit. Yeah, my buddy you know? and I, like, we always like... Like that Panama Red! Yeah. My buddy and I, he lives in Barcelona. We always joke around. We say, whoever comes up with the fucking... The strain with fucking seven percent terps. It has that get, drippy gas flavor and doesn't get you high. That's the person who wins the game right there. <laughs> and I agree yeah. with that. I agree because you know you can only smoke as much as your fucking head can take. You know, but just your mouth, your that that flavor, that mouth coke, that mm, in the back of your throat, on the back of your teeth. You just you want more and more and more of it. You know what I mean? So when you're when we were young and Gabby gave me the Kim dog, he's like two rules. First off, you're not going to like, don't get the same one, but you're not going to really want to grow this one. It doesn't root well. It's hard to grow. Secondly, don't smoke it in a bubbler before 11 a.m., right? Which was funny at the time because all we did was smoke fatties all fucking day. Well, that was then. I could smoke Kim Dog fatties all day when I'm like 20. Nowadays, I'm like, I start to like drool and stare at the wall, but I still want to take another hit because it tastes so fucking good. So... You know, I'm not going to, like, tout less THC and more flavor, but kind of, yeah, I am. <laughs> It'd be amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? For you, how about you answer the same question for her? For yeah, me. What about you? Look, to, get you involved, to get you more involved in this podcast, <laughs> you've barely been involved. Uh, I was enjoying being a fly <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> did, you fall, did you take a nap? <laughs> <laughs> for periods, for periods. Um, look, I think that, I uh, I would struggle to match you two guys. I think if I picked the chem dog, I would that would be like a, a non-functional for the rest of my life. I I would need something a bit more sativa. I'm a bit of a sativa guy. Maybe like a a nice super silver haze hybrid or like maybe that's what we got to do. The the Chaska super silver haze cross chem dog. Yeah, I love that one. Yeah, you're gonna love it. It's good. Have you ever done that one? No, but I've smoked it at your house and it was brilliant. Yeah, it's really good. It's perfect. Doesn't make your forehead sweat, but it's almost the best it's, of both yeah, worlds. Like that. That's it. I love it. I love it. Well, with that being said, does either of you have any general comments or shout outs before we wrap it up? Well, I think you already did it. The the little shout out to the breeders syndicate because they were uh they were really responsible for us thinking about doing this. Yeah. So thanks to them. And um, you know. I'll thank both of you guys again. I'll thank the people that are interested in hearing stories from Staten Island. 
whoever gave me that name, fuck you very much, but I guess I'm going to keep it now because, shit, nobody knows who Gabby is. Staten Island is this famous character. Nobody knows who Gabby is. So my, my new ass would be like, hey, what's up? This is Gabby. Oh, excuse me. This is Staten Island coming to you from Lucky Dog Seed Co. That's funny. So, yeah. But really, thank you guys very much. I appreciate you both. And I hope we get to talk much more. Of course. Well, I think that just about brings us to the end of it. As always, a massive thank you to not just the one, but the two Chemdog Kings, the Incredible Skunk VA and Staten Island, Jason and Gabby. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. There you have it, my friends. A massive thank you to Gabby Garden Spout, a.k.a. Staten Island. And a massive thank you to Skunk VA for joining us on this episode. As always, a massive shout out to our incredible sponsors who helped make the episode happen. Copert, you know them, you love them. Number one in the world for pest and predator technology. They've just recently launched the incredible Spidex Vital Plus. It helps you to avoid having to put carrier material over your crop. If you've got a spider mite infestation, check it out, guys. Slowly releasing the predator mite Phytocellus persimilius into your garden to ensure ongoing release of beneficial predators to get spider mites out of your garden for good. Huge shout out, Copet. Likewise, huge shout out to our friends at Organics Alive. You know them, you love them. They've got the best organic powdered fertilizers in the game. If you're looking to take out some cups, you need to get on board because guess what? People have been taking out cups left and right with their products. They've got everything you need from veg to flour to transition, cow mag, anything under the sun organic, they're going to be able to give you a solution. Shout out to our amazing friends at Organics Alive. We appreciate your support and the amazing products you're giving to the community. If you are sick of smoking joints or bongs and want something a little more healthy, check out our good buddies at Dynavap. These guys have the most sledgehammer vape you have ever tried. If you feel like you've tried vaping before and just didn't scratch that spot, give the Dynavap M series a go. It's cheap, accessible, non-battery dependent, so very versatile, and it is the very unit that helped me to quit smoking bongs. It's got a track record of customers loving it, and made by a bunch of passionate people out of the Midwest of the USA. American made, American designed. What more could you ask for? Incredible products. Dynavap, thank you so much for your support. Huge shout out to our buddies at Seeds here now. You know it, you love it. If you're looking to grab yourself some heavy days genetics, cruise on over to Seeds here now and grab some before they're all gone. I promise you, they only stock the hottest breeders, the latest drops, and their satisfaction guarantee means that you can shoot them a message at the end of your grow if you're not stoked and they will get you right. Check them out, guys. Seeds here now, number one in the industry. We love them, our longest sponsor. Thank you so much, James Dean. We're so appreciative. And then last but not least, a massive shout out to our buddies at Pulse Sensors. I'm sure you've already got a Pulse in your garden, guys. But guess what? The Pulse Hub is now out. A central unit to integrate all of the parameters in your garden to ensure you're producing the highest quality crop to date. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room, or a multi-state operation, it's time to get serious. Get a Pulse. Thank you to you for getting this far. And we'll see you for the next one. We'll see you.